Hello, and with me now I've got Etienne Schneider, who's the Deputy Prime Minister of Luxembourg and also Minister of the Economy, and also Jan Werner, the, the Director General of the European Space Agency. So you've known each other for a while. Yeah, one can say that. <laughs> and with the political and the space agency here, I mean, this is a conversation really about how do you both collaborate and work together. With ESA, the European Space Agency, you rely on funding. You've got wonderful scientists and engineers at your fingertips. How do you convince the different countries to collaborate and fund? So what we have to do, what I have to do according to our convention is to go to the ministers and convince them. And this is called the DG's proposal, Director General's proposal. And this means next year I will go to not only him but also to 21 more and give them a presentation about our proposal and there will be one proposal which is called space safety and this space safety has space debris removal and also tracking it has also the space debris avoidance meaning collision avoidance it has space weather but it also has the planetary defense meaning asteroid impact avoidance of course first detection and then avoidance and so you have these cycles of funding every three to four years? Three years normally, and then it's very interesting. We have one sheet of paper, it's called the famous document 100, where we have all the different member states, and then we have the proposals of the DG with the numbers, what it costs, and then they can sign up either by saying, oh, 20% is fine, or they say, okay, we have about uh, 5 million for this purpose. And at the end of the day, I have to see which of the proposals can be realized. So last time, we were very successful together. We started on the first day with 8 uh, billion, and, and the second day was 10.3. So within one day, to get 2.3 billion in addition was a big success. But how much were you after? To be very honest, for eight. Oh, okay. Okay, <laughs> so this is fun for you. Well, anybody in Luxembourg knows how much you back space, and we'll talk about that later. But when you're there at the political table with the 22 member states of ESA, how do you find that conversation? Do you feel everybody in Europe is really backing the space idea and feeling it's the next kind of Antarctic frontier? Right. You know, when, when we started our Space Resource Initiative and when we first discussed with uh, ESA, when Jan was not yet the Director General of ESA, it was quite complicated because member states didn't really, you know, understand what we want to do. They didn't see the, um, the sense of doing this new space business or developing this new space business uh, together. So uh, we decided as a country to go for it uh, on our own. But, uh, you know, when Jan became DG of, uh, of ESA, he, uh, he contacted me and he said, well, I think we should work together on that. And so we signed an agreement and since we are working together very successfully. And we are putting the, the mining and the asteroid, uh, uh, let's say, deflection or detection, of course, is joint. Uh, yeah. There is a joint link and this is what we try to do. Mm -hmm. And just going back to your kind of your safety plan, the, yes. the next initiative for 2019, how much of your time is so valuable in your position is spent on the now and the projects that are being funded right now with the 10.6 billion or and, and what is thinking about the future? So I should say 100%, but this would not be real. real. <laughs> so we are preparing right now already the whole process. We will uh, deliver to our proposal, my proposal, to the ministers at the beginning of next year already, so that they have time, at least half a year or longer, to really find the money for that, because we need the money. And therefore, we are really very intensively now within the process of defining the proposal. We are discussing with politicians. We are discussing with industri industrialists, with our uh, member states directly, with our heads of delegations. But we are also discussing with normal people and I can tell you if you talk with normal people and explain them all the different aspects to save our planet is highest value that's very clear that's what they say and that means climate change but also planetary defense very high level of uh, with all the members with all the people we ask get the same we get the same answer save our planet and a final word from you, Mr. Schneider. Well, you know, I'm looking forward to all these uh, programs because, you know, when, when Jan said that uh, for the next program we, we're really talking and focusing on, uh, on space debris, that's something we, we think is really very important. But uh, because we, we already nowadays have problems with the space debris because, you know, they, they harm any other uh, commercial activity, for instance, satellites in space. So we have to, to cope with that uh, problem. And then the asteroid impact mission is something uh, 
we already wanted yes. to, uh, to, to realize when we, when we met last time, but uh, you know, we, we didn't find enough uh, member countries which wanted to, to support this idea. So you know, we really hope that that will be possible and feasible next time. Well, we're all on the same side here. It's just convincing other people. Thank you both okay. so much for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now it's back to Brian with another panel discussion. Thank you. We now have a panel on asteroid missions and impact mitigation solutions. I want to start with Mark. Um, so when we talk about moving an asteroid or destroying it, so what, is, what are we actually aiming to do? Well, so we, we in this business, planetary defense, often use the word mitiga mitigation. And the, the dictionary definition is kind of like making something bad less bad. Um, and so making something completely go away, making something bad completely go away is even better um, than just making it less bad. So the, the, the best option is to take something that's on a collision course and deflect it, either speed it up or slow it down so it misses the Earth instead of hitting the Earth when they both cross in the same place. Um, so so the, the best mitigation is making that impact not happen. And there's two broad categories of mitigation. One is uh, slow push, um, and there's all sorts of ideas and ways to possibly do that. Um, that takes years to carry out. It hasn't been, and none of these methods have been tested. Um, the other broad category is uh, a, a sudden impulse. Um, that can be either uh, from kinetic energy, um, from hitting the object with a, a, a very fast uh, bullet-like um, object and, and causing it to speed up or slow down, or in the worst possible case, using, a, using an explosion. Um, we would only do that as a last resort um, to use a nuclear explosion to actually push it. Um, and that's another reason for finding these objects early so we don't have to resort to that option. Yeah, and that's a, the, the, the gentle shift of the orbit is the preferred option. Well, the, the, the gentle shift would be the preferred option if you had found these so early that you had decades to work on it. You really need a long time. It, it depends not just on the amount of time um, until impact, but also the size, um, because the, the amount of momentum you have to transfer um, depends on the size and the mass. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, in terms of missions today, uh, impact missions, we've had a couple of, well, we've had deep impacts, haven't we, a while ago. So what, what is the current state of the art in terms of mission planning for impact missions? Yeah, so the current state is uh, there is one concrete project under study, both at NASA and at ESA, which is called the IDA project, which is composed of uh, the DART uh, mission at NASA, which is actually an artificial projectile that should shoot on a small asteroid uh, in order to push it from its trajectory, basically. Uh, this asteroid is uh, <coughs> called Didi Moon. It's a small moon of a binary asteroid. It's about 150 meters in size. It's very small, so when we compare to Deep Impact that went to a comet, the comet was six kilometers in size. So it's like if you take, I don't know, maybe the dimension of Paris, that would be the comet. And uh, the target of DART is half the eight of the Eiffel Tower. Right. So it's Small totally different story. Yeah. And the thing is, uh, why we need to do that? It's because uh, although things work on paper, unless you validate, you are not sure it will work. And in fact, you know, we, we have now a century of experience in uh, uh, airplanes, and yet when there is a new airplane, you first make a test before putting passengers inside. So we need validation. So that would do the, the, the impact, but we also need an orbiter in order to characterize the target and measure the actual deflection. Because if you want to extrapolate this knowledge to an actual scenario, you need to have an educated experiment with both the initial condition and detailed investigation of the outcome, which would also be an advantage scientifically. Because so far, we never saw a space rock of this size, 150 meters, which is nothing. I mean, we have on Ryugu, which is uh, the target of Hayabusa 2 currently visited, we have boulders which have about the size of Didi Moon on this object. But we never saw such a boulder in space, and we need to learn from that because 150 meter size is probably the most relevant size 
for planetary defense because we don't have any threat from one kilometer object. We know almost all of them and no one is threatening us for the next century. 150 meter size, we only know 20% of them. And even though the impact frequency is also not so large, this is probably the most relevant one to understand how to cope with and to, to defend from. So that would be fantastic, and also because that would be a cooperation between two, two main agencies, ESA and NASA and possibly others, and for an international problem. I wonder if I could bring Ian in, in here, because that, that collaboration between agencies to, I suppose that that plan is to impact a small object That's right. and then observe yes. how exactly. the impact behaves. That's really That's why important. we want to, to be there because impacting, it's very difficult and uh, we rely on NASA to, to carry out that part of the experiment, but that's not the, not the whole story because you actually need to, uh, first of all, have the mass of the, uh, of the asteroid to know exactly how the energy was transferred. You need to know if the energy was transferred in, I would say, you know, in displacement or in rotation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and above all, you want to transform this, um, this push into a, um, a full experiment, meaning you need to know all the boundary conditions, all of the parameters that are involved in this experiment. That entails as well getting a very high resolution uh, shape model of the crater, because when scientists perform impact uh, uh, models, then you want to be able to reproduce that on, on, on computers for the real deflection, should it be needed. So you need to have all of the parameters that are necessary to validate the, the computer models and be able to transform this particular experiment into, into a validated technique that you can apply to a real threat one day. It's, it's, Debbie, it's, this is part of the, the planning process. We've talked about it quite in many panels, actually, but this, uh, to, to look forward. But I suppose it, it probably seems to many people that, well, it's, it's quite simple, really. If there's something coming towards us, we fire something at it and hit it and it goes away. Mm. But th this is not the case at all. It, it's, it's not so simple. No. No, and, and that's the thing, and as, as I sort of mentioned on a couple of the other panels, you know, in the unlikely event that, you know, the deflection mission isn't successful, then yes, as a contingency, you do need to have emergency planning arrangements on the ground. Um, and for me, um, you, when, when, the, uh, when the, the scientists and the engineers and the technicians have got that, you know, that warning period or that, that preparation time or the notification time, then at that point, that's ideally, that's when we need to start putting the contingency arrangements in on the ground. Um, and of course, it's very imprecise to start with, and it's very uncertain, um, you know, exactly as, as Rusty pointed out in the earlier panel. Um, there's this great uncertainty as to where it is and where you move it to. So it's the kind of thing that, you know, you do need to have um, um, a response in place that is kind of mobile, that we can think on our feet, but that we can prepare it in advance. Um, so if it was relatively mobile, you know, whether or not you move people to caravans, but it's, it's knowing which site to put all the caravans on um, or which bunkers to put people into. Um, but it is, it's, it's, it's absolutely key and making sure that everything's ready. Mark, is it how much of a high precision science or engineering effort will this become? I mean, is it, is it ever going to be possible to say, right, we know with, with this particular vehicle, we will move this? Well, there, asteroid. I mean, there will always be uncertainty and doing this double asteroid redirect test will reduce the uncertainty. But unfortunately, that will only apply to that object. And so we, it's really important to characterize the surface and the, the physical properties of whatever object we need to deflect. Um, we do uh, validation experiments in the laboratory, small experiments on a laboratory scale where we have very high velocity two-stage light gas guns and we can shoot projectiles and we can measure the momentum that's transferred in the laboratory. And it turns out that the amount of momentum, it's a little um, not intuitive because you would think it would be a really easy calculation to do, but you can't calculate how much ejecta in a simple way comes out unless you know the detailed mechanical properties of what it is you're hitting. So we do these uh, tests in the laboratory, but we don't know the detailed physical properties of whatever asteroid it is that we'll be hitting unless we go there and do a characterization, which is another reason we need to find them really early. And we need many, many missions, is the, the plan, to well, different asteroids. If you ask a scientist, he has no limits. So, of course, <laughs> we need many missions. But I would say that uh, this first mission is going to be a blind test because we don't know the properties of this asteroid. You don't even know the shape. Yeah. So if we succeed, 
And if our predictions are not, are not so far away from what happens in reality, then it gives us confidence first that the technology works because we target it well, and also that uh, we can have a good educated guess if another one comes, even if we can, cannot have a precursor mission. But in order to make sure of this, we need at least this first test. Mm -hmm. And I think this is important. And the other thing which I think is important to say, sorry for my voice, I lose it, but the, 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 second, the second thing is that this asteroid risk is a the least likely one compared to all the other natural risks we are facing every year, tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanoes. But this is the only one that we can predict and largely minimize with feasible and reasonable means. Even if you could predict earthquakes, you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, avoid it. Yes. It will happen. Asteroid deflection can be possible if we do tests, and making the inventory is also possible both from the ground and even more efficiently from space. So this is, I think, a positive message to the people to say that, okay, this risk is probably not the most important one for tomorrow, but we can mitigate it, we can make the inventory, and we need to do it before it's too late. Yeah. And we have time for it, but it's good because now we know how to do it, so let's do it. And in addition with that, we do science and we inspire the young generation because these adventures are always fascinating. Okay, well, run out of time again, <laughs> but thank you all. We've run out of time because we're going to a break, but we'll see you in a few minutes.